And without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Zach. Let's give him a warm welcome. All right, Zach, take it away. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so uh, as Megan said, uh, my name is Zach Smith, and I am a farmer from uh, north central Iowa. So I reside in uh, Winnebago County, so on the northern tier of counties in Iowa, just touching Minnesota. So on the screen, it says I'm, I live uh, near Lake Mills, uh, but my farm operation uh, is where I grew up about 20 miles west of here near, near the small town of uh, Buffalo Center. And that is uh, where this little experiment uh, project uh, that I call the stock cropper uh, was originated at on a, on a farm just two miles southeast of uh, Buffalo Center there this summer. And so um, that's what I've been asked here to uh, to come and talk about. And so if I have to give you just the, the 15 second elevator pitch of what the stock cropper or what we're going to talk about today is, we're really talking about an alternative re uh, regenerative system that's based around reintegrating uh, livestock with row crops. So something substantially different than what you see predominantly on the Iowa landscape and what my farm operation um, is really all about now in a monocrop system. And so my goal for today in this session is to walk you through kind of this journey as far as uh, who I am and kind of how I got to, uh, to this point with this story uh, and talk about the why uh, part and kind of what's the motivation for driving me this way. Um, then I'm going to walk through kind of the thought process that we had in putting together uh, the system that we call uh, stock cropping or the stock cropper and uh, just kind of share my experiences. This was a, this was a huge uh, chance and guess that we took uh, this summer and we got a lot of things right. We got a lot of things wrong. And uh, so I'm, I'm really uh, pleased and grateful to Practical Farmers and to Megan for uh, giving me the chance to be on this platform and, and share it. And so please feel free at any point if you have questions or comment to interject that and Megan will, will cue that up to me um, here as we go through. So with that, I am going to, uh, to dive in here. So uh, I wanted to start off with a little bit of my background to give you some context because I, I think that is somewhat important to kind of know the direction that I'm coming at this thing from. So uh, my path to, to being a, becoming the stock cropper as I call myself. So um, I grew up, like I said, uh, on a small farm uh, outside of Buffalo Center. Uh, we were a, a corn and soybean operation uh, that my, my dad led and we were had a farrow to finish hog operation. So we did have livestock uh, until I was about 12 in 1991. And uh, so I did have some experience with, uh, with hogs, but like a lot of operations at that time, uh, there was kind of a choice of, you know, getting big or getting out when it come, came to, uh, uh, to that, the hog space at that time. And my dad had an opportunity to, uh, to expand in crops. And so that's the direction the farm went and we didn't have livestock anymore. And so that's the path I had growing up through high school. That was my interest. And so I went off to college at Iowa State and uh, pursued a degree um, in agronomy and, and learned a lot of uh, great things there and great people and absolutely still love Ames. Um, but when, when I was finishing up my career at Iowa State, I began to be a lot more interested um, in some of these paths around sustainability. And so I, I was attracted to uh, the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture. And uh, I was lucky enough to land an internship in 2002, uh, working actually in conjunction uh, with Practical Farmers of Iowa on a product or a project called the Pork Niche Market Working Group. So if any of you that are on here uh, from 18 years ago that uh, remember a, a skinny geeky little kid in the corner taking notes, uh, that was me and now I'm back uh, in this space, which is kind of fun. So, uh, but I was very much interested in, um, in the work and some of these alternative markets. And that was really my goal uh, coming out of college was to start a direct to consumer um, you know, farm operation and start a CSA and things like that. Uh, but the reality was, was when it came out, um, I was uh, looking at getting married and, and needed money. And so I chased uh, the monetary side of things and ended up taking a job as a farm manager with a commodity uh, operation, a corn and soybean operation, uh, not too far from where I grew up. I did that for a couple of years and started a family and wanted to uh, settle down with a little bit more stable hours and really pursue my agronomy degree or use that more. And so I uh, became a, a agronomist and a, a chemical sales specialist for a large independent um, chemical retailer in North Central Iowa. And uh, that job was, uh, it was a great experience. I did for 11 years and I made a, a network of a lot of great people throughout the egg business space and really learned a lot about how 
uh, ag business really works in the in the interconnections and uh, you know kind of the the what pulls the chains I guess in that business. So along the way, um, I said I talked about my dad's farm operation. Uh, I started to uh, to work into that in 2010, kind of during the commodity boom, um, as a lot of people wanted to come back to farming at that point, and so uh, I started to work my way in and. I very much had an interest in conservation at that point and wanted to get my dad converted into some of those principles. And so uh, I worked at integrating in uh, strip tillage uh, into our operation in 2011. And then my uh, dad decided to retire in 2013 uh, after the year of the great flood. And I took over in 2014 um, at that point. And, and now my, op my corn and soybean operation that I continue to run is uh, one of the I think two of the county that practices uh, strip till and cover crops on 100% of our acres. So I'm, I'm proud of, of that attribute. Um, and then last but not least, where I'm at currently today is uh, in 2015, I had the opportunity to become my own boss, which was a dream of mine for a long time. And now I have uh, my own business called Smith Seed and Agronomy that I operate and have a Pioneer Seed dealership along with uh, a list of other services and businesses built into that. And that is uh, kind of where I'm at today in, in the space. So a lot of you are probably watching this and saying, okay, what would a guy with this type of a background uh, have an interest in coming up with an alternative production uh, system? And I think that's, that's fair skepticism about kind of my story here. But the reason is this, I've got a couple of things that have really graded on me uh, the last couple of years. And this is something that if uh, you've been to uh, an, an egg meeting in the last 10 to 15 years. This is a slide that gets thrown up all the time. And usually there's, it's animated and really exciting. And it's meant to get people fired up to, to grow a lot of food, uh, you know, by the year of 2050 when we have 9 billion people. And I've always looked at this slide and it's, you know, I've always kind of treated it with skepticism because the attitude of uh, egg business right now is that we just need more stuff that we just need to keep pumping at our crop and we need you know more fertilizer more fungicides more more seed traits to to get to that point and to me it, it kind of misses the picture because you know, one of my biggest concerns uh, as a farmer and agriculturalist is the sustainability of our soil systems and uh, you know the the biggest resource that we have in Iowa which is uh, the soil itself and so my criticism of the slide is that's great if we can hit the target by nine billion but what if we have eroded uh, our biggest attribute and really creator of wealth, which is our soils, to get to that point and we degrade them. And so I'm more interested in what happens in 2051 and whether or not we have a stable medium to continue to try to feed the world at that point. And I think that's something uh, that the ag space is being uh, fairly short-sighted on right now and something I want to, to take on and tackle and address. The other thing is, uh, what's happening in this business from a consolidation standpoint. So I've given this presentation a number of times. So if you've seen this example before, my apologies, uh, but I refer to this as the funnel of consolidation within agriculture, where we're taking over the last 25 years, we're taking a lot of people that were participants, in a lot of different companies at all different layers, whether it's uh, you know chemical manufacturers, seed companies, um, ma machinery manufacturers, local input suppliers, dealers, all the supporting businesses that you know, constitute this business, we're, we're funneling it down to fewer and fewer participants. And the way that it's kind of going right now is that we're just going to have a few companies left and a few farmers left uh, at the end. And you know, my goal is not to end up of the one of 10 farms potentially to farm a county and, and be the proud owner of an X9 combine. It's not that I hate the X9, I think it's, it's an incredible machine, but I I just don't know if the path that we're on right now where we just have a few people left doing this is really at the end of the day going to be good for uh, you know, our, our soil, our, our communities, and our, our general way of life. And, um, and so I'm, what I'm very interested in is finding a way to potentially offer a path to flip this funnel upside down and dump more people back out into the space. And so that's the thinking that my partner uh, and I, uh, a guy by the name of Sheldon Stevemer, uh, we're both farmers. He's uh, 30 miles north of me in southern Minnesota. Uh, we're both kind of in this midlife crisis. We're both 41 years old and uh, both graduates of Iowa State. Our friendship started through a uh, common interest in kind of uh, in strip tillage, uh, but more so just innovation and trying to find unique ways to differentiate in a corn and soybean row crop production system 
by doing things a little bit differently to gain an edge over just the pursuit of scale. That's really what our motivator was. And we've had a friendship that is, we've experimented with strip intercropping and 60 inch twin row corn, you know, seven or eight years ago uh, with cover crops in between. We've just been really interested in trying to figure out some of these, what I call biohacks, okay? And, uh, but we've never really done anything at scale with them or tried to really push it past that point or widespread adoption on our operations until last winter when corn was, you know, uh, sub three dollars and beans were sub eight and we were looking at man we're we're small operations you know uh, we're, we're both less than 500 acres in size and if we're going to stay relevant we're going to have to really think differently and so we started going down this wormhole of how can we utilize this strip intercropping principle and maybe do some relay cropping in in between and add another crop trying to get a, a boost in revenue to give us a, a, a better system than just corn or soybeans and uh, it was collaborating with another one of our friends up in central Minnesota, a guy by the name of Lance Peterson. And um, Lance had, uh, we were bouncing the idea off him. And he said, well, what instead of a crop, what if you put a pen of sheep in between your intercropped corn? And uh, at first, you know, the reaction was, well, that's not going to work. That's, that's crazy. Who would ever do such a thing? And the more I thought about it, like this maybe could be the answer uh, for a lot of the criticisms in putting not just one species of animal, but a whole multitude of uh, different creatures and kind of this really uh, like a four ring circus type form. And so that kicked off a brainstorming session over the next couple of weeks, which uh, by you know the end of February um, had this idea that you see on the screen that we call stock cropping on a whiteboard. And uh, really the what this system is about is these tenants that I have listed on the screen. These are the things that really drove it. We wanted to create a system that re-intersected and cross leveraged livestock and row crops back together. Basically, what are the, the systems that our grandfathers and great grandfathers used? They didn't have all this technology that we have right now. And so they had to use these systems in conjunction. And so our idea was, well, let's take the technology that we have and intersect it with the way that they did things uh, that didn't really cost anything or you didn't have to pay a tech fee for with using plants and animals uh, in concert. And so that that's really the whole principle of, of the idea. And we wanted to have a multitude of biodiversity that was an absolute must. So, you know, you drive across Iowa, you see a cornfield, you see a soybean field, and then you see a hog barn in one. We wanted to bring all those things together. So multiple species of plants, multiple species of animals. If you're a student of the soil health movement, you know, following folks like Gabe Brown or Alan Savory or Joel Salad, and this biodiversity thing is a big deal and we wanted to build that in. Uh, the next uh, topic or next concept was this idea of self-sufficient nutrient and carbon cycling. So we wanted to make a system where everything was built to feed the other. So when you see the, the, the row crops in our system moving forward, we wanna grow just enough row crop to feed the specific feedstuff need of the livestock that's in the field. We don't wanna sell it to the ethanol plant uh, we want to put it in, back into our livestock and walk it off the farm. Con conversely, we want to have the livestock feed the crop with the, the, the manure that they leave back behind uh, as the barn passes, uh, passes through the field. And the, with the end goal being making our soil better, addressing some of the concerns from an environmental standpoint while still being able to produce protein here in Iowa. And the idea is, is that in order to make this work, we're gonna walk the value uh, off the farm in the form of animal protein in a non-commodity form. And uh, that's really what makes uh, this, this whole thing go. And the last point on is this thing around community where I talked about, you know, if we could come up with a system like this, could we keep more people in place on the land, not require people to scale uh, up in acres, but rather in intensity on maybe the acres that they have. And hopefully, you know, hold on to more people in our rural communities and really make something that is kind of the opposite of the direction of, of where we're going right now. So um, as we, we get into it, you know, a lot of the things we were looking at this is how can we stack the deck in our favor and how we arrange this system. And so there's lots of ways that nature offer or offers up opportunities that sometimes I think the current mindset doesn't look at. And so we thought, well, how can we arrange these things specifically to to benefit us. And one of the things is the power of stack, uh, enterprise stacking within a system. So instead of just having one crop, how can we arrange things in a dynamic uh, or systemic fashion so that we can have multiple uh, entities within a farming system that are stacked on top of each other 
but still working in a smart fashion that's not overloading uh, the system, bringing you know diversity from a biological standpoint, but also diversity from a risk standpoint in revenue streams and things like that. And so that was one of the things that really makes this system work is that we have a lot of different entities stacking on top of each other in stock cropping. The next feature is cross leveraging. So things that benefit the other in the system. So what do I mean by that? As you'll see in a little bit here, you know, we designed our barn to catch rainwater to feed our waters so that we're taking advantage of that structure to feed the system and minimize inputs or the fact that our corn growing next to our pasture, when it gets tall in the summertime, actually provides shade for our animals. So it's relationships like that going back and forth, making the most of these enterprises and leverage them off. And then the last piece on stacking the deck is we wanna make a story that is so good and quality and uh, transparent to the end consumer um, that it's kind of a combustible Edison, uh, combustible Edison and it really resonates with people. They see what we're doing and, and uh, hopefully they're going to be attracted to that. So that's kind of uh, some of the, the thought process behind. So what was our setup for 2020 or what does this all look like? And you're gonna get the visual here if you haven't seen it before. So basically what we did was we used this um, uh, setup of strip intercropping. And so to make sure everybody's on the same page, strip intercropping is the process of planting uh, alternating strips of crops through a field. So a lot of times in Iowa, the people that where this is more popular, they would plant, say, six rows of corn, six rows of soybeans, six rows of corn. And really the benefit in that is it's a way to really boost corn production because if you increase the edge effect or the, the amount of rows in a field that have more light or air movement on the outside, you can grow a substantial amount of corn. Corn reacts to that. And so it's kind of this like a biohack essentially to do that. And so instead of putting soybeans between, we seeded an annual pasture uh, mix in earlier this year. And I'll get to the details on that. And then to make that, to uh, really make it work in, in between the strips of corn, we put, we built this mobile barn that we call the Cluster Cluck 5000. That was our affectionate uh, prototype. And you, have, you do have to be careful with how you say that. Um, but within that barn, that barn was designed to house uh, ruminants out front. They were our lawnmowers that were going to attack the pasture first. And so we had six sheep and two goats that made uh, the cutoff to, uh, to be in the inaugural class. We followed that with 10 pigs that came behind them in a segregated pen. And then uh, three grazing days behind, we had uh, chicken tractors that we uh, raised a total of 185 chickens in two different crops uh, through the system this year. We moved our mobile barn that you'll see in a little bit with a winch system on cabling, um, anywhere between 11 to 22 feet a day. And so there, the animals were constantly being moved into fresh pasture um, every day as, uh, as the summer went on. And like I said, the pasture was a five-way mix and I've got the, the species details in a slide down the, the, the way. We managed the, the corn crop uh, in the system for intercrop uh, maximum output. And what does that mean? It means we planted uh, more offensive, shorter stature hybrids on the outside uh, two rows of the, of the corn passes. We planted them at a significantly higher population to take advantage of that light. And we fertilized those rows specifically with higher amounts of nitrogen to really drive that upper end yield potential that we could achieve on those things. And we did this on a two acre plot. That's where uh, what it existed on here. In uh, so this wasn't a, a huge field scale thing. This was very much a prototype uh, experimental setup. And this is what it looked like. So this is a picture from uh, I think the middle of August where we were already uh, quite a ways through our, our summer grazing um, of the system. And so you can see some of the things I talked about. Uh, so you can see our corn strips here. You can see on, if you can see my cursor on the screen, the outside rows are a different shade of green because they're a different hybrid, uh, a shorter statured hybrid that we planted at a higher population rate. And like I said, fertilized higher, had a different hybrid that was taller in the middle. So we kind of got this dome effect to our corn canopy, which really drove uh, some uh, excellent corn production uh, in that system. And then in between, this, these are our pasture strips. So we had three strips that were 311 feet long. And uh, like I said, uh, moved our mobile barn system, which you can kind of see from afar, but we'll have more close-up pictures in the next slides. This thing was just, you know, yanked ahead 11 feet, 11 to 22 feet a day. Actually, when we were in this third run, they were moving uh, 22 feet a day, uh, usually in the morning and then in the evening. 
And so you can see kind of this pattern of grazing down and uh, we were really dry this fall or this summer, I'm sorry, in Northern Iowa. And so our regrowth was limited to when we got rain, but uh, this was the pasture, the strip that we grazed in June, in August. So you could see that we got some really nice regrowth and then we just didn't catch a lot of rain here, but eventually by fall, all of these strips were green back up again. And I'll, I have pictures of that. So I'm gonna just take you now through kind of a, a slideshow of the season. So you can kind of see what this all looked like uh, somewhat from start to finish. So uh, we seeded the pasture on the 7th of April uh, with uh, just a Hineker drill that I had and uh, set things up like this. And so this is what it looked uh, in early May when things were up with our five-way pasture mix. We uh, were going into corn residue from the previous year. So we did put some, a little bit additional nitrogen on the pasture to get it over the carbon to nitrogen uh, tie up there early. And we strip tilled um, into this corn residue. And this is what our corn looked like um, coming up in, uh, in early May here. So, uh, May was relatively cool and we didn't get a lot of super explosive growth uh, out of the system. So we had plenty of time to, as a lot of farmers do, procrastinate as far as the rest of our tasks. So we still had to build this mobile barn. We had to get it off the screen. And uh, the one thing I didn't mention is that my partner in this project, Sheldon Stevemer, uh, has his master's in ag engineering from Iowa State. That was really helpful uh, because uh, he had access to, uh, uh, well, we designed the, the barn in AutoCAD and uh, he actually works with a metal shop. And so we had access to a lot of the things that we needed to really make uh, this be a successful thing. So this is us on Memorial Day. Uh, like I said, we had a goal of launching the barn on June 10th and uh, we waited till Memorial Day weekend, of course, to start. <laughs> uh, but this is what that looked like. Uh, this is our steel subframe that we put together. We built it really heavy because we did not want to have issues with the forces that we were going to be putting on where there was a lot of unknowns and so we built it to strong and not to break and we didn't have any issues with that. So this is what uh, the first day in the field looked like. Um, this is looking at the barn from the front. So this is our grazing pen out front and uh, you can see the barn here and the barn was divided into two sections down the middle uh, that where I'm pointing. So on the right side is where our sheep and our goats would go in and have uh, shelter and the the left side is where the pigs would be and then the pigs had a door out the back to go into their grazing pen. You can see here this is a good picture to show this uh, rainfall collection system and I've got some more close-ups but you can just see the pitch that we put on the roof to uh, to kind of leverage uh, the natural rainfall in the system as well. This is a picture from the back where we had uh, our chicken tractors that trailed behind as well as you can see the pig pen from behind and kind of how this uh, worked out. So our idea was uh, with putting the chickens in the rear, we wanted to have them three grazing day moves behind the pig pen with the idea that the chickens would serve as kind of the scavengers of what was left, go through the, the other animal manure, glean any goodies out of there and be kind of our fly larva control with that, you know, three day uh, pause in between for the fly larva to hatch. That was a nice theory. I read a lot of stuff about that, but we still had a lot of flies uh, in the system. And that was something that, uh, that we did have to contend with as things went on. So we don't have that completely cracked, but uh, this is a, a Saladin style uh, chicken tractor that uh, we kind of looked at. Uh, we got off of YouTube and did some of our, our own modifications. And we did put a, a predator apron net around uh, the outside, which worked. Uh, really well. So the barn would be winched and we would just manually advance these by hand uh, every night uh, We were, or every morning we would go out and, and uh, move them manually. So uh, the picture on the right is kind of a front view that you can see everything. You can see our, our suspension wheel here that we use to elevate the barn and keep it off the ground so that we can move it along. The picture to the left is, uh, it's not a very good picture, but you can kind of see on the far left side a picture of this uh, steering wheel, uh, the basically a pivot wheel so that we could turn the barn on the, on the headlands to spin it back around. And you can see kind of this crude, uh, you know, cable system that we had. And so in order to move the barn, what we would do every day is we would lock the sheep and goats up into the barn and we would swing this gate up and lock it in place. And then we would go to the other end and tighten our winch and move, uh, move the barn along essentially and uh, pull it 11 feet and stop, come back, let the gate back down. And that way we didn't run our pasture over in the advancement and uh, the sheep come out and they are, uh, it was just like Christmas morning, every morning when they would come out and have uh, this 
wonderful uh, pasture to come into every morning. So these are pictures of uh, the first day of our feeder pigs. And so uh, the thing I didn't mention also about Sheldon, he's one of the last Pharaoh to finish operations in Southern Minnesota that's independent. And uh, so we got our feeder pigs from his, uh, uh, from his herd and, uh, uh, you know, with some Duroc and Hamp and uh, we did have some Berkshire background in here. And these are just phenomenal animals for this setup. Uh, and then we got our chicks from uh, Hoover's Hatchery in, uh, in Rudd here that you see in the chicken tractors. So this is our barn setup, what it uh, looked like on the inside. So some more details. So you can see we had this watering system, which was just two 55 gallon drums that we plumbed together and gravity fed down into cup feeders. This is the sheep pen. So we did have a creep feeder here to supplement a mineral lick. Um, and then one of the key features of the barn that uh, uh, did add weight and some complexity, but we wanted to keep the animals dry and inclement uh, weather. And so we put in tender foot flooring that I robbed out of my dad's old fairway house and cut to size so that we would have uh, a vented floor, but would keep things dry and keep things out of the mud if we had a, you know, a, a period of uh, a lot of rainy weather in there. Um, and the picture on the right is just showing a kind of a closer up of the, one of the clearance wheels that we had and the turnbuckle system that we had to raise uh, that up to get clearance as needed through the field. This is a more close up of our rainfall system that, that caught. Uh, so you can see this is the gutter that we installed in the center of our roof. And this is the uh, plumbing that we put in underneath. And you can actually see that uh, we did the math on this. We could catch nine tenths of an inch of rain and that would fill these two 55 gallon tanks with the surface area of our roof. And so when it overfilled, we wanted to have an overfill where we could get value out of that extra rainwater. And so we piped it back out. You can see down here so that it fed, you can, this is the pipe, fed this outside row of corn at this high density. So we would still be taking advantage of trying to, of that extra water and funnel it where we could get some increased uh, benefit out of that. So Again, kind of that cross leveraging theme. Um, and then here's, here's some of the info on the, the, the pasture strips that we had, um, what we put out there. You know, we kind of, we didn't know how this was gonna work, how fast we were gonna move the barn. And so we had to guess with this and we got some of this right. Um, and I'm kind of walk through our grazing, what we learned from our, uh, the species that we used uh, to establish our pasture. But we were really hoping to have the ability to graze it once and potentially have the ability to come back and hit it again. And that did end up working out. So uh, the mix you know, that we put out there, this is a few days in, it was really dominated heavily by the oats. We had two bushel of oats in the mix and they really did well. And we had an awesome first month of grazing. Uh, but the problem that we ran into is, uh, and this is a picture, I guess, of, of the, the sheep in the morning going out and going to town um, when we would release them out. But the issue we ran into is we, quickly realized that there was not much coming underneath the oats were out competing it. And once the oats matured, we weren't going to have any pasture. We were scared that we weren't going to have much stuff coming underneath. So we came out and actually mowed uh, the oats off in the other pasture runs, hoping if we got some light and moisture down that the other species would take off. That ended up not happening because we had just too many oats in our mix. And so uh, this is what our July strip looked like, uh, which was not a lot to graze. So this was one of our failures. So what I ended up having to do is come in and insert more, uh, uh, more pasture mix. I put in some uh, sorghum sudan and some cow peas and had to wait for that to happen. And so this is what the strip looked like. You can see our tractor out front that we used to winch things along in this picture too. We didn't have a lot to graze. This is our July strip and there wasn't much left uh, afterwards. But remember this picture for a few slides later when I come back to what it looked like in the fall. So eventually, though, that mix, we did catch some rains, and that mix that we seeded in early July took off. And this is our third pasture run, uh, where you can see that we did have some sedan come up and some of the cow peas and some of the forage rape that survived and made it to this point. And we were able to finish really on a, on a high note. This is a picture of actually the first run about uh, 45 days after. So you can see some of that recovery of the species coming back. And you can see this linear pattern as we go through time where it's less and less the closer you get to the barn. But this strip, we were able to come back in September and graze completely again. And, and actually this, this first area where we had, we had sorghum sedan grass that was like nine or 10 feet tall. It was almost the height of the corn. Uh, to come back and, and it really worked well when, especially when we have the, the bigger animals. This is a picture of where what was really barren on that same thing where we had the tractor a few slides back. This is what the regrowth of that looked like uh, come harvest time. So, 
you know, if, if the criti we had criticism like, well, are you gonna be able to hold the manure in the soil? Well, if you have a crop that comes back and is able to do that and take it up, we feel really, really good about the nutrient uh, uh, stability of a system like this if you're gonna be depositing manure. It's much different than going out and putting hog manure on in the end of November uh, in, a, in a corn field or a soybean field in Iowa, so. Uh, and this is what it looked like at harvest when I went through in combine. So you see this really nice lush strip of uh, grass next door to uh, harvest in some really good corn. Um, let me check my time here. Okay, I'll keep moving. So my wins for the season uh, with the system, no animal escapes. Uh, we didn't, you know, we had a lot of people say we were going to lose stuff. Uh, they were going to dig their way out. We'd have losses to predation. We didn't have any of that. Um, we only had one animal that we lost to illness and that was within a week of getting it. I think we had a sick lamb that came in from the get go. Uh, we had to give one dose of penicillin to a hog that had a strep infection. Um, we were able to move the barn. A lot of people thought we wouldn't be able to move that big barn if it was uh, periods of wetness or, but the fact that this field had been managed in strip till and cover crops, we had excellent soil structure. And so I literally, I got four inches of rain on a Labor Day weekend and I was able to go to the barn four hours later and I moved it no problem, didn't sink in. And so it kind of goes to show if you have soil health, a system like this can really um, build off of that. And the other wins is, you know, we had a lot of great observations uh, that we've made and to, to build off. We didn't get it all right, but I'm, I'm really pleased with some of the things that we did get right here. So as far as things we're gonna work on in the future, um, multiple grazing mixes, multiple timings, uh, pig rooting was an issue. If we're going to have a system that we rotate back and forth to feed itself, we're going to have to grow crops where the pigs had gone and rooted. So uh, if anyone on here is an expert on how to uh, ring successfully, that's something that we're going to have to figure out. Um, would also like to uh, build a different grazing strategy for the chickens so they have more vegetation rather than the kind of the barren uh, scape that we had after the pigs. Um, like to figure out ways to uh, to automate the movement of the barn and time movement requiring and get rid of that winch, lighten up the barn design. And then really with this autonomous idea, how do we integrate solar power to drive electric drives? We actually move the thing with electric motors uh, at our field day at the end of the season. Um, how do we integrate that more? And then uh, backgrounding our livestock. So that's really uh, some of the things we wanna work on. So, um, you know, to kind of uh, work toward the finish here, a lot of people have said, well, how does this work from a money standpoint? So here's my Jerry Maguire slide, and I'm going to kind of uh, churn through this stuff uh, so to make sure we have time for questions. But so a lot of people said, what, what is your barn cost? Uh, what realistically, because this looks really expensive and big and kind of onerous. So how do the financials work here? So we had about $15,000 into our barn. Um, and so if we just did some rough financials, amortizing that over seven year life, the barn would last, I think the barn that we built would last 25 years. But if we just did seven to show a banker, we'd have an annual payment of 2,600 bucks. So this is our cost from a feeder animal and our feed cost roughly about 1,900 bucks for the, for the stock and about 1,900 in feed that we had. And if you wanna look at these numbers in full, I've got a whole YouTube episode where I break this stuff down further, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna keep churning. Um, so this, were our, this is what our total expenses were. And I, I list per acre because when we designed the barn, we designed it essentially for the barn to pass over the course of an acre in a season. And so it makes it for simpler math if we just put everything into per acre terms. But in total, when we add everything up, we had about $8,200 of, uh, of estimated expense here with all things uh, totaled in. So that's a lot more than what you have in for corn or soybean production. But you're producing um, things in a way where you're producing significantly more re revenue as well. So we, uh, we used pricing based off of pasture raise, uh, average pasture rate or the lower end actually of pasture raise pricing for both pigs and chickens and tried to use uh, uh, close to, you know, sale barn values uh, for selling the, the sheep and the goats that we've uh, sold up to this point. And we end up with a value coming out of the system of about 10 for. So if we look at the, the corn enterprise itself, so we not only have livestock, but we have this row crop. If we were just to sell that out, what did that do? Well, we ended up growing 262 bushel corn in that uh, intercrop third year corn on corn situation. Now I did this, I put this together a month ago when corn was closer to four bucks, but still a substantial profit, 398 an acre. Um, you know, for, uh, for the, the corn enterprise. If we compare that to if I just would have planted the corn regularly, uh, would not have had that level of production. So neighboring corn on corn fields, probably in our area, more close to 210 times four. 
you can see the math difference here. So a couple hundred dollars difference in just having the different arrangement of uh, corn in that system. So if you add it all up and look across this two acre span, we had around $2,200 of uh, per barn acre of profit there. We had a $398 corn uh, per acre profit. To add the two up, divide them. We had about $1,286 uh, per acre of average profit in the barn row crop system. So 7X the time of what if I just would have planted corn there. So as we look for things to find weight farmers to stay more resilient and uh, more independent and on their own. Uh, it's returns like this that make me a lot more excited about figuring out how you can try to scale uh, this thing out in the future. So what are my key takeaways? This was a really promising first year. It was made possible by interacting with lots of great people. And I'm hoping that today I can connect with even more of them and get more input because uh, it's really taken a village and I appreciate everyone that's you know followed or or uh, listened to what we've done. We've got a lot of room for improvement. I think those numbers uh, actually from a return standpoint could be doubled uh, if we optimize things uh, from and learn some of the lessons and we're able to improve upon them uh, moving forward. So there's a lot of things that we can improve in this system, gives me a lot of hope. Um, the biggest thing is the, the what a lot of people in this space face is the, the marketing and processing hurdles. And I don't have those answers today. And I know I get that a lot. Um, I'm focused on trying to, uh, right now I'm trying to make a system that is uh, uh, solid enough that some of those things will attract the people that will help me figure those, those challenges out. And I liken it to uh, if, if you're going to uh, try to be in the cupcake business, you better make damn sure that you've got a good cupcake before you build, uh, build you know, or, or buy an office space. And that's kind of what we're trying. We're making sure we have a really good cupcake here. Um, and the last point is that uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. We, this is one year. We've got a lot of things to learn, and uh, we're going to keep uh, keep churning on it. So um, as far as where we're moving in the future with this thing, uh, for 2021, I am planning on building more stock cropper barns. I'm thinking uh, right now potentially two or three more. And with the specific goals of figuring out some of these other uh, configurations and, and technologies that we want to add in. So I've had people ask me about how do we integrate cattle into this? I don't have that figured out, but we're gonna, we're gonna have a barn that has cattle uh, this, uh, this summer in it. Uh, people ask about lane hen, how do you uh, integrate uh, uh, egg, egg production into the system? I'm gonna try to figure out a way to do that. And then I'd like to have a barn that's set up just around this autonomous uh, movement piece to figure out how can we get this thing to walk uh, across the field on its own to make it more scalable because it's not gonna be scalable to winch 30 barns in a field, 11 feet every day. And so I'm very interested in figuring that spot out. Uh, like I said, multiple grazing programs, partnering with people to help that are smarter than me in that space to figure that out. Um, and then really, this is a really key one, this fourth uh, one, quantifying the carbon and environmental overall efficiency of this system, if there is one. Uh, I'm speculating there is, I think there's a lot of efficiencies here, but I wanna partner with somebody that can help us establish a baseline to see if we're actually moving uh, the target um, or move, you know, moving the needle on that space. And then uh, the last thing I'm gonna be testing is this idea of growing row crop mixes that can specifically be fed back to the livestock with the least amount of processing and done on farm to, again, this idea of retaining as much value on the farm as possible for, uh, for the farmer uh, to keep more of us out here. So. Um, with that, I think that's my last slide and I have uh, all of this info up here that I would say um, I've got my cell phone number listed. If you would like to follow up with me, I completely welcome that conversation. Do not hesitate. I've had several conversations like, oh, we just don't know if we should really reach out and talk to you. Please reach out and talk to me. I love having conversations around this stuff. So don't hesitate to give me a shout or send me an email. Uh, what, the one ask I would have of the audience today is uh, one of the things I didn't talk about is uh, we live streamed uh, our barn every night on Facebook Live. So I set up a live Wi-Fi camera to so that we could stream in 4K out to the barn so that people that were going to buy these products could see exactly how they were being raised. And one of my goals for this year is I want to be able to stream 24-7. You can't do that on Facebook. You can do it on YouTube. And so... I'd ask that you go to my YouTube page. You could help me out with one thing and hit subscribe on that button because if I can get over a thousand subscribers, I can stream 
uh, this thing 24 seven. So I'd really appreciate if you could help me out with that. Um, but these are all the other social channels. Uh, I do a lot of stuff on Twitter, ze at Zebulus Prime down there, our website. Um, that's it. Uh, that's that's kind of our story. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, uh, Megan and and PFI has been awesome to uh, to kind of welcome him in the space, and it's it's awesome to be back and interacting with a lot of great people. And I'm really looking forward to uh, the Q and A session. And uh, and if you're not comfortable with asking something on here, like I said, don't hesitate to to reach out to me uh, after this. So thank you very much. Zach, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, thank, thank I you. learn from you every time I talk to you. So we do have some questions. People are excited. First of all, I want to say a little note from Mary Wiedenhoff, who taught Agronomy 392, and she remembers you from class. Um, Mary's, she, Mary's uh, I'll just say if she's listening, Mary, you're one of the reasons uh, that I'm here. So um, thank you. Oh, that's really awesome. So Mary asks, did you have enough rainwater for watering the animals and did you have to supplement water at times? Yeah, so I didn't explain that uh, very well. So, um, you know, we it was a drought here. We only had like 14 inches of rain up until Labor Day this year. And so it, uh, we were really in a, a water deficit. Um, so yeah, we definitely this year had to uh, supplement. And in our setup, we were close to a hydrant, so we cheated and we just ran a hose out and we could easily turn that on, hook it up. But when it did rain, like I said, it took nine tenths of an inch of rain and that would give us enough water for two days in the barn. So if we, you know, had normal rainfall in our latitude, which is 30 to 35 inches a year, um, we could generate, you know, quite a bit of water and not have to chore that out. Now, if this thing is to scale out, we're gonna to have to come up with a system or some sort of technology to get water to the barn. But our idea was we wanted, we wanted to have enough carrying capacity on the barn to hold one to two days of feed and water, so. Okay, next question. Um, what's your labor requirement? So do you have like an hours per week per barn breakdown? <clears throat> yep, I do. So that was built into uh, the labor number. And uh, um, if you were, I think in an ideal world, we'd like to have it down so that even if things were autonomous uh, with movement, that you would still have at least 15 to 20 minutes a day of coming out and inspecting things. There's always something just to, you know, from a husbandry standpoint to be on top of the animals and make sure that everything's okay. Uh, that would be at a minimum, I think, uh, uh, requirement there. And I think in, in my numbers, I was using like $30 an hour. So a, a, a good wage to, to have somebody um, be present and, and a participant in that. So, um, Zach, how did you decide how many of each animal to put in the system or to start with? Well, a lot of it was kind of using the WAG system. It was kind of a wild ass guess because uh, we really, we we really didn't know. Uh, I guess the one thing I would say is um, my partner uh, is very very good. A swine producer and we wanted to have a minimum metric on the barn so that the animals had at least eight square feet of uh, space when they were fully grown knowing that they were going to have a lot more room outside than that but if we had to lock them up we wanted to have that minimum requirement so that is what guided how many pigs we had and that just ended up to be 10 pigs uh, the sheep and the goats um, we tried to do some estimates on the daily amount of forage needed for them and we kind of and we were pretty close to be honest with you on that um, and then the chickens, it was just, uh, from a, again, a square footage in a, in a chicken tractor, of you know, what can you humanely put in there and, and have a, and have a good system. Uh, and I think, uh, I don't know, I don't know that things would change a lot other than the fact, I think we could put more chickens in than what we have and, and figure out ways to increase that production, uh, in the trailing system behind. So. Thanks, Zach. Let's see. Next question. Um, thoughts on how you, how to integrate cover crops in order to start grazing earlier in the year. So, yeah. like spring, you know, early spring grazing. Will graze strips over winter to give you grazing before planting corn in the into those strips? Yeah. So um, the answer to that is yeah, most definitely. And um, if I had more time, uh, we would have that established now. Right now, I have uh, cover. I have cereal rye cover crop seeded into my site for next year, and we did get a good start. Um, but one of my, if we do get an opening window here, I'd like to go out and maybe frost seed um, at least my early run, so that we have the ability to get out 
sooner. Like I said, we didn't launch till the middle of June this year. And I'd really like to get to the point where we could come out and start uh, the middle of May, at least with some of the barns to kind of spread our production window out over over time there. But yeah, the having a living root in this system or multiple species of living roots year round is absolutely paramount going forward. Another question looks really good on flat ground. How would it work on rolling ground, draws, ditches, etc.? Yeah, so that's very fair criticism. And uh, you're right, it, uh, I'm f fortunate to farm up here in the hinterlands where things are relatively flat, uh, but fully realized that uh, I was driving across southeastern Minnesota this weekend and uh, in the karst uh, topography over there, and it's like, how could I make this work in the hills? Um, but I think, um, especially with um, some of the automation features and uh, some of the additional engineering, I, I think it would be possible to come up with ways for the system to walk or uh, kind of uh, articulate across the landscape. It's just a matter of getting connected with the engineering talent to make that happen, so. Have you done any soil testing at the end of the season or after grazing? So uh, no, that's one of my uh, my shortcomings from last year, and the only reason why is uh, I was just I was kind of trying to hang on to a tornado on top of running all my other businesses while doing this, and so uh, that's one of the things that we didn't get from last year. But like I said, moving forward, we're going to be moving this year to a new virgin site, and I do want to have baseline. Uh, data sets established before so that we can trace you know the row crop acres the animal acres from start to finish we just you know when we started it we had no idea if this was even going to work um and so we have a little bit better context to to be on that horse for next year so great do you have any thoughts on reducing fertilizer your fertilizer needs for next season or like what other soil benefits and observations did you make well, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the efficiencies of the system is to get off the reliance of the need for synthetic fertilizer. Um, and if you can have animals just cycle nutrients through and, and put them back on. I, I think what I'd really like to do is figure out the loading rates that we have right now and quantify exactly how many nutrients we're depositing out there uh, across time and space. And uh, I think, you know, when you look at the additions in the biological activity they're going to happen versus a monocrop system. Uh, I just think once we have animal uh, a diversity of animal manures uh, cooking with biology or biology in the field, um, it's going to be a, a combustible lettuce. And I think, you know, if you're still going to do corn production, you might have to add some additional nitrogen. Um, but I think for a lot of crops, I think this is going to be a really robust way to produce feedstuffs when you trail behind where we've gone with the barn. Zach, are you thinking of selling barns? Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> but we are not there yet. Uh, like I said, with what I'm looking forward uh, to this year, uh, I want to make sure that we're getting the iterations right and we're, we're, we're going to build something that is useful to people and uh, that people are going to, you know, that's going to be very functional. And uh, that's something that's really important to me. So. Uh, there is a possibility I'm actually working this week on it uh, with trying to figure out um, some options to, and the steel market's really screwed up right now, and uh, there's some big delays, there's some other complicating things, but if it is, it may be possible, if you're interested in wanting to get one of these barns out to play with, uh, with our new iteration, um, please contact me. I would need to know that sooner than later if this is something that you would like to experiment with us on, that would be phenomenal. So cool. Um, does the system make sense in other crops such as soybeans or is it best for corn and why? So the one thing, yeah, the one thing I didn't uh, differentiate well enough is that no, I, the only reason we did corn this first year was because that was what was easy uh, to me. Um, moving forward, like I said, I don't, we want to design the system so that the row crops we put out there are specifically there to feed the animals the following year. So for example, I'm thinking about next year uh, trying to maybe figure out how to grow field peas because I wouldn't have to uh, run them through an extruder like a soybean uh, to feed them back to, to the animals and maybe growing enough corn or maybe it's 
uh, wheat or barley or some other energy source um, to devise the ration that we could, you know, produce ourselves this year and then take and mill back and feed back to the animals. So you have, you know, this just continuous loop of efficiency on the farm where you're not dependent on shipping stuff 58 different directions and having it come back, uh, keep it and retain the value for the farmer. Do you have any thoughts on the pace of moving paddocks? Move more often or larger pens might keep plants growing to give earlier regraze, um, maybe more benefit from the cover aspect of the crop? Yep, so uh, it's a great question. And uh, the, <laughs> the answer is, is it changes with time as the animals get bigger. The, what we figured out, you know, our initial movement of 11 feet a day was, was just about right. Uh, but as things get bigger, especially if the, uh, the pigs uh, are doing more activity with rooting, um, we need to move more often and uh, the ruminants need to move more often to, ha to have enough uh, vegetation there. So, you know, part of the idea is, is that if you could have uh, this, you know, in an more of a, an automated system that maybe the, the barn could creep constantly throughout the day on its own and uh, or you know, be have a computer program that as time goes on, it moves, you know, maybe three times a day instead of uh, just once or twice on a, on a schedule, so. In response to the, um, does it make sense to grow other crops in the system? Tony Thompson suggested, like you said, field peas, um, triticale, sunflowers, buckwheat, barley. Oh, yeah, I am open to anything and anyone that now, I'm not a forage guy. I'm not a livestock guy. I'm a crops guy that is trying to figure this stuff out. So if people have ideas on how you can help uh, me come up with a solution where we can, that feeds in well to what we're trying to do, I'd love to get the ideas and feedback. So. So we still have five or six minutes for questions. Keep them coming in the chat box. Um, I have a question for you, Zach. You had said that, um, so the chicken bar, the poultry pins on the back those aren't connected and you have to move them manually so do you have plans like in the next iteration to connect those and they'll also be drug by the barn yeah um the reason we didn't do that this year we talked about having it all be one and just having kind of a long extended hitch mechanism um so it would all be connected but we wanted to have the ability if we needed to get up and work on the barn we needed a path to be able to do that and so that's why we made two chicken tractors uh, so that we could move one out of the way to have a access without running over the corn. Um, I don't know if moving forward, the chickens following is gonna be necessarily the way we go. It may be that we have a different, in order to have poultry part of it, we have them starting at a different time on a different lane and uh, graze them through that and then wait a month and then bring the the, the bigger animals through at that point and kind of you know, do kind of a chase uh, scheme in the grazing thing. It's, it's kind of a complicated Rubik's cube from grazing when you're trying to move all these things through at different times and achieve some of these things. But um, I, you know, the, and the other reason is too, is that if you're going to chore the barn and pull up and unload feed and water, you need to have a way, you know, to approach it from behind. Like if you have a, a ranger set up or something with a, a choring uh, system in the back to deliver those things and the and the chicken tractors make that tougher when they're trailing and especially when we didn't get the benefit like we were hoping out of you know significant reduction of fly control um it just made it and the fact that they didn't have as much vegetation as i'd like them to to see them have to browse upon uh versus if they were just you know free range in a pasture on their own um that's something i wanted to improve upon too so a couple questions came in around marketing. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, how did you market your livestock or meat? How or where were you able to sell the few sheep and goats that you raised? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> you know, like I said, the marketing is what I did the poorest job on uh, just simply because of uh, the, the amount of time that I had available to do it. Uh, we were lucky to get butcher slots for the pigs um, down in Clarion open up in October. And uh, I was able to get the pigs all sold, uh, basically just through you know, our social channels and people saying, hey, we're interested, we wanna support you. And uh, that's how that worked. And the same thing with, uh, with the chickens and uh, uh, the sheep and the goats the same way. You know, Friends and family or people that were fans of it, uh, that's not a sustainable strategy. And that's one thing that if 
uh, especially for this year with the plans of expansion, I have a lot more animals to move. I do have butcher slots uh, reserved uh, for um, a lot of it already uh, if we're going to go ahead with those rates. But uh, that's a piece that I have to get a lot more disciplined on. You know, I was focused on the system and the development around and I figured the animals would take care of themselves at the end and they kind of did. Uh, but if we're going to expand, we've got to have a better plan than just hope <laughs> at that point. So, but the idea is, is that, you know, trying to, the, the marketing idea of right now is how do we partner with uh, direct to consumers, to people that uh, value stuff produced in this way, going, uh, you know, through a locker uh, to them into their freezer or partners uh, with restaurants um, or other folks down. There. I've got a lot of I got a whole bunch of other ideas I could talk another half hour on uh, unique marketing things, um, but that's probably for another time. So, Zach, is there any fear or possibility of animals getting stuck like in the pin as it moves? Uh, yeah, that is, uh, that's a legitimate concern. Um, I think if, uh, if there was uh, automation, there would have to be design features built into uh uh, warn the animals somehow or have something in the back that would uh, keep them uh, from getting pinned. You know, chickens are probably the the biggest concern. The pigs, pigs really didn't have an issue. I could move the barn and without getting the pigs up and they would get out of the way. I never had an issue with And it's slow enough movement too, um, but that isn't. But chickens, uh, you can definitely get chickens caught. And I think I've got some ideas on how you could design something in the back of a chicken tractor to get them up and moving. Uh, yeah, to, okay. to, to avoid that. But that's a good question and concern. Um, an, another comment. Um, Tony Thompson wonders if an unfenced egg mobile would work without losing hens. So it would have like an automatic door for nighttime. The hens could wander a bit more and that might reduce pest pressure on the corn. Yeah, that's, that's going to be the experiment because that's my idea is to have an egg mobile with the hens able to wander. Um, yeah. But I know that that's going to be ripe for predator activity. And um, I, I just don't know if, you know, some people have said, well, maybe get a, a guard animal to be out. And that's an idea I'm open to. Um, but I don't know. We'll have to see. But I, and whether it's uh, them just roaming or maybe even having the hens uh, confined inside of the pen so that they're, you know, maybe they're with, if we have a, a cow out front, maybe they're just in the, in the cow pen and we can find them to have the nesting box uh, in that. I know there's some concerns with poultry and, and their manure with uh, some of the other animals, but um, all of the, all of those ideas are on the table for, for this next year.